There are very few people who know more or have thought more about the Israel-Palestine conflict and about U.S. policy in the Middle East than David. He has a distinguished career as a journalist. He was diplomatic editor of Haaretz newspaper and editor of the Jerusalem Post. He was the first Israeli journalist to visit Syria. He's the author of numerous studies, a very important study, Making Peace with the PLO, the Rabin Government's Road to Oslo, and a recent book which he co-authored with Dennis Ross, Myths, Illusions, and Peace, Finding a New Direction for America in the Middle East, and we will have books on sale after the uh, meeting, so get your copy, and you buy it now, you can get it to sign it, so you'll have an automatic collector's item. Uh, David is really one of the uh, most thoughtful people on the Middle East. If you have any interest in the area, you see him on CNN, on Channel 7, on Channel 4, on PBS, maybe even on Fox News. Whether or not, he is definitely fair and balanced. So without further ado, I'm in, delighted to introduce David McCoskey. Thank, Thank, Thank you very much, Marshall, and it's nice to see some familiar faces, and I'm, I'm honored to be here. Um, I thought I would uh, I'll try not to talk too long and uh, try to focus how I see the Israeli-Palestinian situation. Might have a couple thoughts on Iran, although I don't uh, come up to Marshall Brieger's ankles. Uh, when it comes to knowledge of Iran, it's just that the Iranian issue uh, plays so heavily on everything else. My co-authors at the White House um, focusing on Iran, uh, Dennis Ross, and he's also focusing on the Arab-Israeli issue too. So uh, although he wrote the three Iran chapters in our book, so some people reading it for, 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 you know, for clues. So, but now, that, so now we have to ask the voice is the voice of uh, uh, Jacob, but the hand of Jacob, the voice of Moses. Mm -hmm. So we have to. Well, he, he wrote it. We wrote the book before he came to office. I mean, he can't do anything now. Uh, he can't even give the book to his boss, who so we'd like him to give it to on his way to a helicopter with a lot of journalists standing around. Uh, but um, we, we divided up the chapters, and uh, he's a tremendous guy. And. Um, Anyway, look, let me just start on the Palestinian thing. I, I, I'll try not to go on here too long so we have a good discussion. Um, you know, it's, it's very, you know, it's so fashionable to be depressed about the situation in the Middle East. I'm reminded of a story of my aunt and uncle who uh, are a big Boston Red Sox fan and uh, went, to, their daughter married a big, a fanatic Yankee fan. And the question was if their, uh, daughter uh, of the, uh, what would they be? Is, and as baseball loyalties passed on in a, through patrilineal descent or matrilineal descent, there's different views. Some people think it's patrilineal. But, um, but she did thought uh, that she would go to a t-shirt store and, uh, in Boston and she asked them, uh, the owner of the t-shirt store, do you have a logo that's half Yankees and half Red Sox? The guy looked at her and said, lady, you are crazy. There will, there will be peace in the Middle East before there is a logo like that. So it has become the embodiment of the lost cause, I think, for some people. And uh, I, I thought maybe I'll be a little contrarian uh, here a little bit and say how I think developments on the ground have actually uh, improved even as the negotiations have, have stalled. Uh, where developments have improved is that um, you know, in, in, two th in the area of security for the first part. In, in, two th in the first half of this decade, Israeli and Palestinian security officials were shooting at each other. And this intifada had 1,000 dead Israelis, 3,000 dead uh, Palestinians. And in terms of attacks, if you want to look just on the attacks on Israel, 410 Israelis were killed on, in 2002 alone from attacks emanating from the West Bank. This year, the number of Israelis killed is one, one person. And, um, and now you can say, well, maybe it's the IDF, maybe it's the Shin Bet, maybe it's Israel's security barrier. 
I think it all are partly true, but I think it's also because of Israeli-Palestinian security cooperation. Because I think the real story has been uh, a, a converging interest of Israel and the Palestinian Authority in avoiding a, a situation like Gaza in 2007, when the PA was literally pushed out of Gaza. I say literally because they were pushed off of rooftops and by Hamas and, and things like that. And um, it was a wake-up call, I think, for many of them. They, they appointed Salam uh, Fayyad as the uh, prime minister. He's known to many of you. He was the guy who was the, uh, you know, who was a PhD from the University of Texas in economics, 14 years, I believe, at the World Bank, International Monetary Fund. He is a believer in good governance and is someone who's trusted by the world uh, that the money does not get diverted uh, for corruption. And uh, I think he is trying, you know, and these things do not happen overnight, but I think he's trying to create a culture of accountability in a way that was an anathema to Yasser Arafat. I think for Arafat, he believed philosophically we're an occupied people, and therefore we're responsible for nothing, we're entitled to everything. I think the, the Fayyad view is the opposite, which is, uh, you know, if, if we don't, build our own institutions, if we're not accountable to ourselves, why should anyone help us? Very diff different attitude. It may be formed out of different experiences. I mean, I think uh, Arafat, you know, the first Fatah offices were in Algeria in the early 60s, I think 63. I'm sure that experience of Algeria had a big impact. But uh, I think Fayyad is something very different. Uh, there's security cooperation. There are hundreds of meetings, uh, the Israelis and Palestinians meeting together. I was just talking last night at a, a reception. Um, a three-star U.S. general was there and a new Israeli military attaché. Um, you know, and uh, they confirmed to me that after Fayyad ordered a raid on a Kalkilya mosque where Hamas, where there was a shootout, he went to a stadium in front of thousands of people and gave the soldiers a medal. For, 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 their, for their raid. I mean, you could not imagine Yasser Arafat doing that. Um, and so, and he has said, if you shoot an Israeli, you're an outlaw. Uh, but I don't think he just sees it as something as a gimme for the, uh, for the Israelis. I think he sees it as dividends for them. Because with the security situation improving, and by the way, you look at uh, Khalil Shakaki's polls in the West Bank, uh, Palestinians never th thought they were secure in their own homes. Uh, the numbers never reached more than 20, 25 percent. Now the number is 58 percent. So it, 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 has, uh, it has an impact in terms of their own perception of security. It's had an economic uh, implication. Uh, a guy told me he went to see Fayyad. He said, you know, I was wondering why don't you push the Israelis more on taking down checkpoints? He said, I don't have to. He said, if I, if I improve the security uh, situation, they'll take down the checkpoints. Uh, if I do it before the security situation is improved and someone gets through, they'll blame me. But if they do it, uh, they do it after the security situation is improved, they'll do it on their own. And the number has dropped from 45 to about 12 or 12 or 14. But uh, that's all a function of, of the security cooperation. And so I think there's been some movement there uh, on the corruption issue. Uh, routinely, 90% of the Palestinians said the PA is corrupt. They said that under Arafat's time to Khalil Shikaki, the pollster. That number's been cut by a third. Now, you'd like it to be cut, you know, down completely, but um, the perceptions take time. But those perceptions are happening. Now, that, you know, he paid a price for that, Fayyad, because he didn't bring in some of the old guard of Fatah into, into uh, the cabinet. But... Uh, you know, he's maintained, I think, um, his approach. And we see, we see this play itself out in places that we wouldn't have imagined, in the mosques. Um, I asked, the, I meant to meet the minister of the Waqf, the head of the uh, religious affairs of the PA, uh, who was appointed in April. He said, he said we have 1,800 mosques. Somebody, Tarawi, of the head of intelligence, told me it was 1,100 mosques. Whatever it is, it's a lot of mosques. And, uh, and uh, he said, you know, we're, we're focusing now on the mosques. I mean, if someone really did studies on this, it would be fascinating. Uh, the head of Palestine security said to me, uh, we've taken 200 imams, the clergymen of the mosque, and we've, we've moved them out of their jobs because we found they were kind of uh, radicalizing people to become suicide bombers and agitators for Hamas. They now have sermon sheets uh, that they 
uh, that uh, you go to one of 12 walk offices in the West Bank on a Wednesday for the Friday sermon. Now you can say, well, what does that mean for the freedom of expression of the, of the ministers? I don't know, but uh, I think that um, they're, they're very focused on this now. This guy said to me, we can't stop there, the, the, the PA minister said. We've got to go to the teacher seminaries. We have to find out, you know, why, uh, who is, what is it in the curriculum of our imams that is radicalizing them? So uh, we've got to keep going. This isn't a Jewish organization. This isn't the United States. This isn't the state of Israel talking as a PA uh, cabinet minister. So I look at issues like security, economics, corruption, religion. I mean, just you know, very briefly, but I see changes here uh, because I see this converging, uh, convergence of interests that uh, they both believe if Hamas is ascendant, Israel sees it as a terror group, and uh, the PA sees it as trying to bring us back to the 12th century. Um, so I think these are issues, um, and uh, I think that there's been some progress. Now, um, you know, I don't mean to say we're in a messianic age, you know, all the problems are solved, but I think one of the most interesting developments, and getting back to the more philosophical point, is Fayad's focus on institution building. Um, and he has said uh, to me, he said to others, I think he said to President Bush, uh, after Bush's visit to Israel for its 60th birthday, he said, look, look what the, the Zionists, how they built the country. You know, they built institutions from the Balfour Declaration in 1917 to the state being formed in 1948. Uh, how did they do it? Um, they built institutions. They built the Haganah. They built the, the Hebrew University. They built the Hadassah Hospital. They built the Histadrut, the trade union. They built all these different sorts of institutions. And uh, we have to do the same thing. And that's remarkable because, again, getting back to the earlier point, the philosophical difference with Arafat, who said, you know, we're occupied, we can't be expected to build any institutions. I mean, he had institutions, but basically security institutions that served him. But, uh, you know, he's, Fayyad is speaking very differently. And I think, you know, uh, it would be interesting to know what America could do to help him in this effort of institution building. Now, do I think that what I call bottom-up uh, approach is going to solve all the problems? No, because I believe if we don't have top-down negotiations, we won't have the political space for people like that. As I like to tell Jewish audiences, you know, the alternative to Fayyad and Abbas, is, it's not the Hadassah women of Brooklyn. It's, it's Hamas. And if these guys fail and are discredited, who picks up the pieces? So we have to think about that and what that means. Um, I think, um, you know, there, but there's been some, like I said, some encouraging signs on the Palestinian side. I think um, on the Israeli side, would, have we seen a certain evolution there too? I think to some degree, yes. I, you know, I'm not pleased about some decisions that just happened these last 24 hours about building in certain places, but... I think that, you know, if you would have told me, I covered Netanyahu uh, as a journalist, uh, I traveled with him, I interviewed him many times. If you would have told me that uh, he would have, uh, you know, called for a two-state solution, would have said, let's not expand the settlements, would say, we have to help the PA against Hamas and not just talk about, you know, anti-terrorism, but other things. You know, he used to play to his base. I think he likes the fact that he's more in the middle of Israeli society and that uh, he's, he's viewed by some Israelis as, as having mellowed. Now some would say, no, it's not that he moved to the center, it's that the Israeli body politic moved to the right and what was used to be the right is now the center. So I mean, I know that approach. I do think that given some of these statements, he never would have made them in the 90s. Um, but the question is, what can you do? And, uh, you know, there's, 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 pure, there's a lot of reasons to feel dispirited. We saw Abbas's uh, denouncement uh, recently that he wouldn't run again. I'm reminded of the story of, uh, I think, Talleyrand, the uh, statesman of France, who, when there was a Turkish ambassador who died, uh, he said, I wonder what he meant by that. In other words, we assume everything is a calculation. But the guy, was, I think he's, everyone who talks to him said Abbas is really, he's despairing. He feels everyone has let him down. Um, I think he feels that the Arab states have let him down, that, um, you know, that on the, this whole thing called the Goldstone Report, uh, which was like to look into to what happened in the Gaza War, 
he, the Arab states, and him were basically working with Israel, I think, uh, you know, at urging Israel to go after Hamas. And he didn't want to make this a front and center issue. But when the issue came up, all the Arab states kind of fled to the exits and let him take the bullets uh, and the, you know, the, you know, the arrows in the chest, so to speak. So he feels let down there. I think he feels the United States, uh, I think, uh, boxed him in uh, because once the Obama administration says, you know, settlement freeze, that sets the bar high. But he can't be less Palestinian than the United States of America. It's impossible. So he has to say freeze. He's, he never said freeze in the past, and, uh, but this time he did. But then the U.S. cut a deal with Netanyahu, and he's still out on the limb with no ladder to get down. So I think he feels boxed in. And I think with Netanyahu, he feels, okay, let's, even if I found a way to the table, will there be a deal here that is, uh, if I go over this hump, if I get over this hill, will I, will I meet a mountain? Well, you know, will the next obstacle be the negotiations themselves will be too daunting. So I think he is despairing, and I think this is of concern to the administration. It's concerned everywhere because Abbas is not that he's such a charismatic leader. We all know he isn't. But his instincts are moderate. He put Fayyad in that position. And unlike Fayyad, he has the party credentials to be elected president because he has been with the PLO and with Arafat since time immemorial. He was more of an academic, a theoretician. He was not considered a, a, a fighter. Um, but uh, he's, he's of that kind of founding generation. There's really nobody else of that founding generation. So if he goes, there is some one or two names you could throw out, but very questionable. If he goes, it opens up a succession struggle that could really envelop things in a way that won't help us on a lot. And um, so I think people just, you know, they don't want him to create a vacuum. And Fayyad, even though he's the kind of go-to guy for everybody, he won't run as president because he doesn't have that Fatah uh, credential as, as from the mainline party. So, so you've got that piece, which is uh, where he feels, Abbas feels let down, no one wants him to leave. At the other hand, the question is, can he make a deal? After all, Olmert offered, you know, Olmert in his lame duck phase did offer a deal that was, um, you know, that was something. Uh, that no Israeli had, had done before, and it's unclear why he didn't take it. When I go to Ramallah a few months ago, they all said because he thought Omer was a lame duck and he couldn't do the deal anyway, but it's got people more despairing about the very enterprise of peacemaking on the Israeli side, and the Palestinians have their reason to be despairing. On their side, believe that peace conferences are easy to do, but results are a different thing. My own view, I hope you don't mind if I turn to, to, to football for a second, and I'll translate to, for people who are not the football fans. I'm afraid, and, and again, I don't mean to be sacrilegious, so I apologize. In football, there's a play called the Hail Mary, and uh, that's, a, that's a long, desperate pass. And uh, that's when you kind of are at the end of the game, and you just feel you have nothing to lose by throwing the ball as far as you can, and you see who catches it. The odds are most of those passes are either incomplete or intercepted. And the quarterback could get sacked, too. And I just think if we look that America wants to go 100 yards down the field, the odds are if we throw a Hail Mary, we're not going to do well. I say this because, uh, and you know, Marshall's done some fantastic work on the issue of Jerusalem. I feel the leaders have not prepared their people for accommodation there or on the refugees. And when it comes to the issue of security, in my view, the Israelis failed. They got out of Gaza, and all they got were rockets. So in the land for peace formula was land for vulnerability, land for terror, land for rockets. And uh, I was invited to see Condi Rice right before the Annapolis conference. I said, you know, the Israelis feel they, they read the book in Gaza. They don't want to see the movie in the West Bank. So, you know, you could say objectively then if these are uh, three of the four core issues are so hard, what can you do? And I would say throw a screen pass, throw a shorter pass, but take the ball 70 yards down the field. I think, ironically, the issue of land is where the differences are relatively narrow. Now, that might be counterintuitive to some people because they think it's all about the land, and oh, they'll kill each other forever about the land. The truth is the Israelis, I think, would like to give away the land if they felt they would get security for it. Uh, in 2000, they didn't feel that way. After Gaza, they didn't feel that way. 
Uh, I'm not here to tell you to say the land is easy. It's hard. This is the West Bank is the biblical patrimony. I don't have to tell this audience. But, um, and the numbers were bigger than Gaza. But I think the differences between Omer and Abbas were 4% of the West Bank. And so my view is, if, if we wanted to focus things, and this is an idea that, you know, I, I feel is gaining some traction at, um, you know, I'm, I hear from the White House, it's one of the two ideas they're thinking about in terms of the next phase. And Joe Klein uh, wrote a piece in Time Magazine a couple weeks ago called How Obama Could Earn a Nobel Peace Prize. And he interviewed Brzezinski, and I, you know, I'm not obviously nowhere near his league, uh, and he interviewed me, and I put forward this borders idea. And he liked it, and he said, you do this, you win the prize. And I, I said, look, the main thing is, is finding out where does demography meet geography in the West Bank. I mean, that's the core. If you unlock that piece, you could unlock a lot. And so if you drill down, what you find out is that 80% of the settlers live in less than 5% of the land largely adjacent, I say largely, not exclusively, adjacent to the pre-1967 lines and, uh, uh, you know, to the Israeli urban areas. And to me, that, that's the core of, um, in all this, is finding where that is, where are that, and then try to find a way that both sides get a big win. The, all three sides, for that matter. Let's start with the United States. What's in it for us? What's in it for us is by demarcating a border, um, we end the settlement issue that's been plaguing U.S. Israel relations for 40 years uh, because uh, there won't be any settlements. Settlements will be moot if you have a border. If you're in the border, you're not a settlement. You're Israel. If you're out of the border, you're done. They go in the border. So even though a majority of the settlements are outside that, that, that 4.5%, a majority of the settlers, 80% of them, are in a minority of the settlements in that zone. So there's an idea called land swaps, which is that Israel would keep, but it would be a pay-go system. You keep 4.5%, you find 4.5% uh, somewhere else. And I've, I've done that research. I think this is something that's doable. I, I, I was even just today, just today at lunch, show Mofaz of the... Um, of the um, Kadima party. He used to be the chief of staff. He used to be the head of the central command in the IDF. Now he's number two in the opposition. And I remember during the Barak plan, when he was chief of staff, he led uh, an effort by the army to say you can't give up the Jordan Valley. But uh, today he doesn't say that anymore. He also talks about the blocks in the same way. Um, I think that this is an area that that gives, gives, gives us a chance to move forward. So what's in it for the United States is, is, is ending the settlement issue. What's in it for, Amer for the Palestinians? I think you want to create a situation, you want a solution that gives dignity to both sides. I think if you could tell the Palestinians, you get 100% of the West Bank, you get what Anwar Sadat got in terms of the Egypt, of the 70, Sinai Desert in the 70s, you get 100% of the land, they don't care about Israel, what it keeps in terms of the blocks. And I, I've tried out this idea in Ramallah with some very senior people, and I feel that they don't care if Israel gets what it wants as long as they get what they want. So I think in, instead of talking about another piece of incrementalism, the latest piece of salami, you know, I think something that each side can go home at night and say, I got something big. I got 100% of the land. And what does Israel get? Uh, to annex um, these uh, settlement blocks of 4.5% where 220,000 people live. Bibi Netanyahu called me into his office in uh, J July when I was out there. He already had the book. I had written some for him, and he had already marked it up. And he said, you read a piece in the Wall Street Journal about this idea. I want to talk to you about it. And I, you know, I said, Mr. Prime Minister, you always say in land for peace, Israel gives something tangible. That's the land. But what it gets in return is not tangible. It's, it's ephemeral. It's the theory of peace or something, but it's not peace itself. But what if you got something every bit as tangible as what you gave? Something tangible for tangible. Wouldn't you look at it a little differently? I said your, your predecessors from the Likud, from the, from the conservative party, um, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak Shamir, Ariel Sharon, they never succeeded in annexing one person. Why? Because only the Palestinians 
can give you that annexation. You can't do that unilaterally. And these people have been dangling chess pieces, dangling bargaining chips for 40 years. 280,000 settlers. Now, it's probably closer to 300,000. So how long can you keep that going? So it seems to me, if you found a, a, a focus on a borders agreement that would demarcate it, uh, the two-state solution, and each side could say, I got something big. Um, to me, there would be a value to it. Now, uh, on the security, you'd have to be very careful how you phase it in. It has to be done carefully, given the experience of Gaza. But I think that this is, on the borders, is something that, that gives some hope and a, a direction. Now, let me just address the pushback issues, as I call them. What will each side say they don't like about it? The Palestinians will say, by deferring Jerusalem, are you conceding Jerusalem? And I would argue that that's not accurate. That's what they said about Gaza. And here we're talking about the West Bank. I don't see Jerusalem as tucked away in the Himalaya mountains somewhere that nobody's going to be able to find it. It's an international city with all the three major religions, with uh, all the press corps, with all the consulates. Everyone's going to be focused on it. There's no way people are going to forget this issue. Now, the Israeli argument uh, go, but I would, do, I would try to do in Jerusalem some red line understandings on no expansion of neighborhoods in East Jerusalem, which I do think is important because, you know, it's one thing to say we'll kick this can down the road later, but that won't work if one side thinks the other side is exploiting the time for its benefit. So, you, you know, I think that's, that's the caveat I would do there. But I don't think we're ahead of the game if we know we're going to fail, you know, to try things that, you know, that won't succeed. I just feel in the Middle East, if it's all or nothing, it tends to be nothing. And I don't think the leaders, I think the issues of Jerusalem and refugees have become issues of self-definition, and, uh, and the leaders have not prepared their peoples. Now, um, I know there might be differing views, but uh, on the issue of refugees, I see it basically, by doing it this way, I've tried to set up phase two as the, as the trade-off of Jerusalem and refugees, where Israel's going to have to make um, uh, concessions to Jerusalem, and the Palestinians are going to have to make concession on refugees. That's actually the pushback on the Israeli side. If you think that you can, Israel is going to keep all Jerusalem, you won't like this plan because you're ending up trading in a lot of territorial cards for, you know, to make this work. If you think you've got such a fantastic territorial hand to play, you might say, why, you know, why should I splurge all my cards now when I've got these other issues coming up? And I just think that it's, it's, it is set up for this next phase as I see it. So anyway, that's how I see that, that issue. I just feel if it's all or nothing in the Middle East, it's nothing. I had a, a French diplomat in my office this morning. Happened to, I said, you know, you know we say uh, nothing's agreed till everything's agreed. We guarantee that nothing will ever be agreed. <laughs> so I just think let's move where we can. Do we score a touchdown? No. We move the ball 70 yards. But we're much better positioned from uh, after a 70-yard run than we are being in our own end zone. So to me, there's an advantage of trying this. Um, and I found a lot of interest um, from a variety of, uh, variety of places. I just got a note from someone today who met with the foreign minister of Jordan. And uh, also they liked the idea, okay, Mubarak wrote an op-ed in, in, in the Wall Street Journal also in favor of it. Um, I think this is the only way, practical way at this time, in my view. I realize there will be other views. Um, let me just pivot over to the Iranian issue, and again, I, I uh, yield to others who know much more how I see it, where we're at right now. It seems that, you know, we're in the, we're in the phase one. Uh, Dennis and I wrote this book, and uh, we, had, you know, we called it Engagement Without Illusions. We ourselves did not know if engagement would work, but we felt you had to try. You had to try because it might succeed as a strategy and you come in good faith. And if it doesn't succeed as a strategy, it could fail as a strategy, but it might succeed as a tactic. And, and, and framing all your subsequent options and making them more uh, legitimate, uh, more credible. So I think we're still in that phase one. I think the administration was very pumped up coming out of Geneva. Uh, my understanding of that, what was they were discussing, 
was the idea of it takes, and again, I yield to others who may know more, but my understanding was you need about 2,000 kilo of low enriched uranium to convert into uh, high enriched uranium for nuclear, for, uh, for, uh, nuclear fuel for a bomb. And of course, you have the IAEA there, so converting is not so simple. You'd have to throw up the, the International Atomic Ener Energy Agency inspectors. But uh, my understanding is that they were at about 1,500 kilo and, uh, until now. And, you know, it's not, you know, people want to blame the administration, but the administration inherited a situation. And I think the Iranians liked the old situation where no one was talking to them, and they just kept spinning more and more nuclear fuel, <laughs> it, you know, under, under the isolation policy. Um, the idea in Geneva was to say you take 1,200 kilo out of the country of the 1,500, so you're down to 300 kilo, and you use that 1,200 kilo that gets processed for medical isotopes for the Tehran research reactor, but basically you've bought another year. So if this was a football game again, instead of being in the fourth quarter, being down by two touchdowns and America just changed its coach, you've reset the clock to be at halftime. Uh, that was the idea of the administration, not as an end game, but as a beginning to give you that extra breathing space. Now, you know, if it's the domestic politics in Iran where the dissidents on the left are outflanking the government from the right, uh, I mean, there's all sorts of things going on. It might be that the opposition isn't so coherent. We don't know. And it might be that, the, you know, the, these guys are brutal and they will, you know, put this down anyway. So it's hard to base a strategy on, on the opposition, and, and I think the administration was right not to base it all on the opposition, in my view. But um, anyway, I would just say the following, that uh, it seems to me there's no likelihood of a positive answer, and we might be surprised, but without a positive answer on the 1,200 kilo, I think the administration is, is trying two different ways for the next phase, that it's testing out simultaneously. One I call the Rolls-Royce and one I call the minivan. <laughs> the Rolls-Royce is the Security Council. If you can get Russia and China on your side, then you can use sanctions to ratchet up the, the pressure. But you might not get it because despite all the efforts uh, and the President's meeting this week of Medvedev and he met the leader of China, China, for example, might say, as they tell visitors in Beijing, you know, we need 8% growth for our uh, political stability. If we don't get 8% economic growth, we're not, it impacts our, po our political situation, not just our economic situation. So you might not get China. And uh, then the question is, what's the alternative? And I think the, the, the countries of the like-minded countries is, is where the administration is also focused. And you have the Europeans who, um, you know, one of them, I think the ones that I talk to, the, the diplomats that come to see me, uh, of a, lot, a bunch of different European countries, they do want to go to this next phase. They feel the Europeans, uh, the, the, the Iranians have lied to them for many years, and they would like to see the movement to the phase, to this next phase. But there's an irony, you know, there's a paradox in all this coalition maintenance. The broader the coalition, on one hand, the more bite, but the broader the coalition, the more you end up making deals to keep the coalition together. Uh, the scope of sanctions, the timing of sanctions. India and Turkey want the Security Council resolution that authorizes them and the like-minded, but if you can get a Security Council resolution, you wouldn't need the like-minded countries. That's US, Europe, South Korea, Japan, Australia, Canada, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. I think uh, the Europeans tell me they have 24 out of 27 countries. They don't have Greece, they don't have Italy, but they've got almost everybody else who want to ratchet up, but they're waiting for a sign from Washington. So I think Right now, the United States, is, you know, on one hand, wants to pursue parallel tracks, but doesn't want to anger Russia by so openly pursuing this, this parallel approach. And it's still, the president said, he'll wait till the end of the year to make a decision. Now, some say, look, forget all this stuff. Who needs it? You know, containment worked in the Cold War. Containment will work here. That's what's important. But I think you have elements, uh, and I realize there are people here who have studied this more than me, but there, you have elements here that you didn't have in the Cold War. I mean, the Cold War, you had NATO, you had 500,000 troops. It was pretty binary of the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Uh, you had hotlines from the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everyone had diplomatic relations. You had communication. And uh, you didn't have this messianic uh, impulse. But I would argue, even if you assume... That, uh, that the Iranians are completely rational actors, just like the Soviets were, uh, which is a question, but let's assume that. 
that doesn't mean they won't miscalculate. And the lack of communication means the prospects of miscalculation are greater. That's why it's good to have a lot of communication. But I, I think that this is a, this is a problem uh, that, with the analogy. And you certainly don't have hotlines between Israel and, and Iran, for example. So what happens if sanctions don't work? We all hope we don't get there. I mean, obviously, they, you want to solve this issue politically. Because that's obviously preferable, I think, uh, to anything else, because military things can go haywire. But as an analyst, I would say, not as an advocate, but as an analyst, I tend to believe that there is a chance uh, that if, you know, maybe second half of next year, and some say, oh, the Israelis are bluffing, they, they can't technically hit them, it's impossible. But I tend to believe that uh, despite the differences with the U.S. and Israel, over, over an ethos. The American ethos is the Colin Powell doctrine. You know, you identify a target, you demolish it, you get out. The Israeli ethos is being not a, a superpower, is do what you can do, when you can do it. And uh, the Americans have been traumatized by the Iraq war. People said, oh, it's a cakewalk, oh, it's a slam dunk, and it wasn't. The Israelis feel that they've been told a lot of uh, worst case scenarios about the OC rock and the reactor in Iran. Iraq in 1981, of course, this is far harder. I can go in to explain that. They were told in, in 2007, you hit the Syrian reactor, a war with Syria, it didn't happen. They were told you'll never stop suicide bombings with the Intifada. And then they told if you go into Gaza, you'll lose tens of thousands of soldiers. So they feel a lot of the worst case scenarios have not materialized. But these are different ethos. I think the good news is there's a lot of consultation. Uh, but you know, even if people share the same facts, they don't share the same interpretation of those facts. So just to summarize these two issues, Palestinians and, and the Iranian issue, it seems to me that uh, the challenges are multiple. There's some good news on the ground on the Palestinian front that has to be translated on uh, not just bottom up but in a top down way to, to give the political space. And the Iranian issue, we should pray for a, a political solution which is far preferable than anything else. Um, and uh, maybe I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's terrific. And you can sit if you yeah, want. Yeah, I will. Be no, I'll sit. I'm going to start with two questions, then I'll open yeah. it to everybody. First, um, I don't know enough about the Palestinians, but on the question of a border settlement, which I think is a very creative idea, I just would ask you, do you think that the Israelis, and specifically Netanyahu, has the uh, capacity of, um, of making that kind of compromise. I find, it, I mean, it's true that a majority of Israelis now say they want two states. But when I talk to one, we must keep the Jordan Valley. Another person, we must keep Beitar. These are little areas. Another one, well, we'll do it, but we must keep Ariel. Another one, we must keep the Gush. When you add up all the, all the areas where different people say they must keep, there's not enough left. Uh, so someone has to make some very tough choices. Right. Goodbye, Ariel. Goodbye, Jordan Valley. And I don't, you know, the question is, does he have that capacity? On Iran, I think, again, your analysis is really good. My question for you is, what would cause the Israelis to go forward with an attack? And do you think, what is the likelihood of that? All right. On the first point, you know, does he have the capacity or... You know, the other question is, does he have the will? Um, I think if he wanted to, he's got Sipi Livni waiting in the opposition, uh, the head of the Kadima party, that has to join his government because that he didn't think he was serious enough. And if he was serious enough, I think he would lose some people in his own coalition, but uh, he could pick the, those people up in the wings that would be part of it. So I do think there's an issue more of will than capabilities. Um, and also, I think with him, I've done some work and we actually sent a memo to his office, uh, voting patterns of non-block settlers. And I found something curious, which is what I, I thought, and my gut told me, but I said, let's do the numbers and make sure we're right. Um, the, most of the, 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 the settlers in the non-block areas, in other words, the rest of the 95% of the West Bank plus, did not vote for Netanyahu. They voted for the National Union Party, the Settlers Party. Now, he, more right wing than more Netanyahu. right wing. Now he didn't, yeah, he didn't include them even in the coalition this time. Now was that because Ayub Barak didn't want them in the coalition? I don't know. Uh, but he didn't include them. So on one hand, you say you don't want to alienate the non-block settlers, 
but uh, you know you didn't seem to care enough that they didn't vote for you uh, by a two to one margin, while the block sellers voted for Netanyahu by a two to one margin. So I think there's a clear fault line there, and um, so I think mean, it's a question of will. To get to your point on the Jordan Valley, it's clear to me that if you want to keep the Jordan Valley, there's no way you can do this. It's impossible. The Jordan Valley is 35% of the West Bank, the way Sharon defined it. And that's what was interesting to me with Mofaz today at lunch, that he did not uh, say that he said the eastern border are those block settlements. And I asked him explicitly, and we're going to follow up the phone conversation tomorrow, but to me, he was chief of staff, and some of the people always thought it was more right-wing uh, than anything else. And if he's saying that, maybe you know there, there's something that, that's interesting, worth to, to follow. So you're right, Marshall, that if you want to believe you can have a deal with the Jordan Valley, then uh, that's 35%. I'm talking about less than 5% of the area. And I think, ironically, if you add up these blocks, um, they do not, you know, even uh, believe it or not. In that eight, in that five percent, less than five percent is even Ariel or Fran Venta, believe it or not. So that's point one. Now, on the issue of what will we'll let Israel to pull the trigger, I think it's contextual. I mean, what the Israelis are, are, are in support of them, they are on the sidelines now. They are not trying. They're skeptical, of course, that Obama will succeed with Iran, but I think they have, uh, and, but Netanyahu made a public statement. There's a logic to, to <coughs> trying, you know, you know, what do you lose by trying? And I think that the Israelis are staying out of it, are not trying to get in the frame, not getting on the playing field, and, um, and as the U.S. goes through phase one, and the same will be with phase two. Uh, there might be a question, uh, at what time do you say phase two with sanctions has failed? That's going to be an interesting point, or, you know, but you have to start. But, but, in, but in the meantime, I think they are, um, they are they're staying out of it. So I think their point would be if phase one, phase two fails, then uh, phase three will, will, be, will be viewed differently. Now, you could say, in theory, yes, but in practice, will it? I mean, come on, you know the Arab states hate Iran. And uh, one senator met a leading Arab foreign minister and said that Israel would have, uh, you know, would attack uh, an applaud from the veranda. But uh, the other half of the Senate says, uh, I'll condemn them in Al Jazeera. Uh, you know, I, I joke with the one guy from the Gulf, an Arab friend from the Gulf, who said, we have no problem with the Israelis. We're not associated with them. So we can condemn them and benefit from them. That's the cynicism of the Middle East, the split screen reality. So to me, you know, I, I, I Israel is kind of counting on the fact that if it's just uh, Al Jazeera and, and, and the UN General Assembly, they, they will survive it. Uh, but clearly, they would like some, you know, they have very close consultations with the United States right now. You've got Gates and Barack, uh, Abe Barak working very closely together. You've got Mullen and Ashkenazi on the phone together all the time. You have working level people below that. Then you've got Jones and, and Uzi Arab meeting once a week, uh, once a month. You have Dennis. Uh, you know, focus on this. It just, to me, this is a huge issue uh, for the U.S. and I think it'll be contextual when the string is run out. Now, it's clear that one of the, the Iranians have 2,000 kilo that they could convert into a bomb, they'll get more nervous. That's why the 1,200 kilo, I thought, was such a brilliant idea because it lowers the temperature dramatically. Everyone is relaxed all of a sudden because you have that extra year to work with. But uh, now it looks like that isn't going to happen. And it's true. Right. So, uh, I'll, what, the, what the, the Iranians, I mean, I. I, I think you read the latest IEA, IEA report yeah. from just two days ago yeah. about the uh, secret, quote, secret installation right. in Calm. They, yeah. they can't believe it's the only one. Right. So then, so you, get, you, then you get to the issue of, you know, point. what you know, what you don't know, you know, and, you know, he knows a lot. I, I, you know, I, we don't know, we don't know, but I, look, right now it seems all theoretical because it doesn't seem like they're going to go along anyway. But, um, but I do think, you know, the administration takes a lot of hits and people say, oh, they're dithering and, and this and that. But I do think they have a, you know, they, they have a strategy, which is to try and engage in it. And if it fails, then kick it to the, to the, to the next level. Now, it might not work, 
But I think that's what they're going to try to do. And I think the Israelis want to give them that time, uh, to, you know, uh, at least for another, I don't know, is it until the second half of next year? I, I mean, that's what we keep hearing, but nobody can tell you for sure that they know, obviously. And uh, you have to be very suspect until, until it happens. Yes? Hey, uh, let me just ask you, <clears throat> there's basically two questions. You know, the first is, you know, you use the, the football you know, analogy of the hail Mary and changing right. the clock and, and all of that. Right. And, and, and you also use the image of the chess piece that's kind of dangling right. Right. from the ceiling. You know, and, you know, how do we know? I mean, do, is there any, any real sense that, that, and I'm going to use another football analogy, but it's much more of one day. That we're not dealing with Lucy and Charlie Brown. Yeah, yeah. You know, that the you know, they go run and kick the football and all of a sudden they're laying on their back looking up. I mean, so how do we know that that there's really somebody somebody willing to catch the catch that Hail Mary on the Palestinian side? Like I said, I wouldn't do the Hail Mary, I would try to do the screen pass. Well, I mean even even a screen pass. Yeah. I mean, no, no, it's, it's fair. I think look, you'd have to you know, you'd have to have a lot of U.S. Uh, Israeli, U.S. Uh, Palestinian consultations. You would probably say you're taking on everything, but the sequencing would be borders first, and a lot of these other issues would be, uh, you know, we'll be dealt with later. But you'd have to, you know, you'd have to have a clear understanding uh, from both sides of the idea of what we call the one-for-one -one swap that Israel keeps land and gives land, and. And that would be something that, as you know, Marshall kind of hinted, is that something that Tanyahu can really accept. Where's the land that you give? Well, I've, I've got a lot of maps on this, and I, I think there's areas here that are you know, quality land, and they're contiguous uh, to a Palestinian state. Uh, but I think once you get about 5%, <laughs> you run out of land. So, uh, you know, there's only limits. But I think the irony is 80% of the settlers live in that area. so. It seems to me that this is something that's doable. I just, you know, I'm so worried about the Lucy and the football uh, myself because of, I don't believe a grand deal is possible. I believe they'll tell you certain things you want to hear, but when you push comes to shove, it won't happen. And that's where I am worried about the Lucy and the football. I think your ability to execute, to implement this, because you're trying to achieve less, even though it's huge, but it's more manageable than everything, you have a chance. Uh, in a way that you don't, I think, I think you really would have to see the football field if you do the classic version of final status. Take all the issues on. Oh, this time we're more serious. Oh, we're not Arafat anymore. You know, I don't believe that. I just, I don't think it's, there's been any conditioning of the societal landscape towards the direction of accommodation on anything related to symbolic issues, whether it's Jerusalem, whether it's refugees. And so I share those fears, but I think the more mundane issue of the land, it's basically understanding what a one-for-one -one swap means. And that, once you accept the concept of one-for-one, -for -one, meaning the ratio of you keep, you know, a dunum, you give a dunum, uh, it, you know, then you're, you're already, there's the limits of the, to your permutations, frankly, because, so, I, I do think this is possible. I, you know, I, I, would you take the land, would you give the land from the triangle? That they're going to narrow That, that is very controversial. The triangle is an Israeli Arab area. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, I was trying to think out like against myself, okay, what's like worst case things that could happen? Imagine Israel says, look, one for one, if it's Israeli sovereign soil, we'll decide where. And Lieberman said, let's run the next election on where that is. And he'll say, it, it, I think they're Lieberman, and let's say I'm going to run it on, on, on the triangle. I'm actually doing a map on, on I work with a cartographer, and this, I'm not sure the triangle actually makes a huge difference. I deliberately, in my work, did not bring the triangle in. I just thought it was political dynamite. And I, I try to stay out of areas that were populated, because then you're not just exchanging land, you're exchanging people, and it, it gets more sensitive. But, but you're right, Marshall, this, I mean, it, you know, Lieberman would run, would love to run an election on, okay, one for one, I have no problem. I'll tell you where the one for one's coming from, and they'll say that area. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David, I think your um, proposal about uh, land swaps and so on um, is a very fine idea. I'm glad you formulated it. But 
Um, lamentably, look, I'm sure you know what I'm about to say, but, uh, but as the one that is Lamentably, it's based on the assumption that each side is involved in the utilitarian calculation of its earthly utilities. Um, uh, I see that uh, the Shalane Institute just translated Hobbes' Leviathan into Hebrew. Um, they don't realize what's actually in it, but it's about the dangers of religious influences on politics, the disastrousness of religious influences on politics. And it seems to me that. Sorry, what did they translate? Hobbes' Leviathan. Oh, uh -huh. books, three three about, and, yes. books three and four of which uh -huh. are taught everywhere in their talk about. Written about the period of time during the Civil War. Yes, but, but in any case, um, uh, that's just a, a historical detour, but, it, but it's relevant here. It seems to me that you're discounting forces that you know exist on each side. Uh, you know, the fact that you say that Fayette has this uh, intelligence uh, agency that is uh, distributing sheets, talking points to mosques on Wednesday. Um, the, the Ministry of Religion. The Ministry of Religion. If, if they could distri distribute those talking points to synagogues in Israel um, and in the West Bank, uh, um, things I think would be a lot better. Unfortunately, Israel is a democracy and you can't do that. But my, my point is that there are um, religious voices that are not minor religious voices in the national Orthodox camp in Israel that, as you know, um, extend to uh, an increasing part of the Israeli officer corps, who are graduates of these uh, military religious institutes, these Hezder Yeshiva, um, and they are absolutely opposed to these things, not on the grounds of earthly utility, but on, on religious grounds. And then, right. they, and then there's that, and, and, and who engage, and parts of this national religious camp, as you know, who live in the West Bank, live in a sort of wild west, uh, Lifestyle where they where if uh, if uh, if the Israeli government closes down an, an illegal settlement, these people go and burn Palestinian uh, olive trees and so on. If you take that on one side, and then you take that other thing that you barely mentioned, David, but you know it's there, Hamas, um, and their commitments are also not those of secular utility in terms of their calculations, and they are obviously uh, as as you did indicate the the most important thing on the mind of people in Fatah and PLO. So when you take those religiously motivated uh, maximalist forces into, into account, it's very hard to see how one could get to your scenario unless Netanyahu was genuinely willing to, to marginalize those people. And as you say, that's partly an act of will and it's partly an act of political calculation. I, I'm sort of I, 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 I would love to see your plan executed, but on these religious grounds on both sides, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, the, the, bur the uh, burdens to them are too great. All right, well, let me, uh, let me just give it. You, you were very, Terry, as you know, you, you were very eloquent. Uh, and, you know, obviously these are huge issues, uh, but in my view, um, look, you're trying to do a few things here. Let's talk with the Jewish side a little bit from Hamas, okay? Yeah. Let's go one by one. There's a reason why I wanted an 80-20 split and not uh, the Geneva Accord of uh, Yassi Balin was like a 50-50 split. 80-20 would give you this, the towns of Beit El and Afra where the settler leadership lives. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not accidental. Um, you, you basically want to split the settlement movement and give 80% of the people a stake in success uh, because they've been all, 100% of them are living in a legal limbo. And tell 80%, you're going to be upgraded. And, uh, you know, uh, it's the 20% that you want to bring in, compensate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, we're very much off the record here. I'm not, the, you know, but you would be surprised. I've had leaders of the settlement movement come to my office and now invited me to speak to the executive council of the settlement movement. I feel some of them are tired. And even the ideologues who've been at this for 40 years. And certainly the largest settlement, right. which is Haredi, right. they'll sell out the others in a minute. Right. They, they, they don't need that. 80% includes definitely the Haredi, the ultra yeah. orthodox. So I think in a certain way, you know, there's an. You, I feel you don't do any help by demonizing 100% of the settlers. You, you, you don't try to, to rig it in a way that 80% have a stake. In a success, not that 100% have a stake in, in being spoilers. So I, and again, meeting with these settler leaders, and I, you know, 
I mean, you've shown them some of my maps. I had pleasant surprise they could say they're lying to me, you know, they just want to gather information, I don't know. But I, I feel that uh, there's a chance here because even they don't know what the end is. And when they started the settlement movement in, uh, after the Six Day War and after the 73 War, their, their motto was frankly, 36 to 39, you know, Oma Migdal, where you build a settlement and then it gets incorporated and it's all part of uh, Israel, but they didn't see this demographic wave of the Palestinians. And they, they say to me, we don't have the Israeli people behind us, we're dead. You know, our strength is that we're, we're part of it. We're separatists, we're isolated, we lose. So, I don't know, I, I just don't think by throwing in the towel, um, you know, it, it, it's, 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 you know, I think it's worth an effort, especially if you could incorporate 80% of them, um, including their leadership. It seems to me. Now, um, on the uh, um, you know on the on the Hamas side, I would say, look, right now you have a question. The Hamas is is largely in Gaza. Uh, you, in the West Bank, basically, the Israel PA the intelligence services have really worked in a way that Hamas is uh, you know is, is 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 very contained. No one now in Israelis, you could say after an agreement. Will it be as contained? All I can tell you is the polling numbers that I've seen of Khalil Shikaki, of uh, what's called the IPI, and the, Israel Peace, uh, the International Peace Institute of the United Nations, JCC poll, that's the Jerusalem Media Communications Center of uh, Rasa Khatib. All three different agencies, none of them are Israeli, they all put Hamas at about 18 to 28%. Shikaki puts it at 28, IPI puts it at 24, JCC puts it at 18. You mean within the West Bank? No, in total. Oh, and no. they are just used burning the election. Yeah, it's but I mean, number. they're all, I mean, Hamas is not 10 feet tall. I mean, the people living in Gaza have said, you know, what are we getting out of this? I mean, you know, we, we, you, know you promised the social services and business as usual, and the siege has not helped. So I think that they are not 10 feet tall. I think you're better off if you want to beat Hamas demonstrating that the moderates have something, you know, to show than, uh, than just not having anything to show. And then these guys pick up the pieces. See, I told you Fayyab was a Zionist, you know, you know, he's got nothing to show. So I, you know, I tend to think that the, the only justification for a, a stasis approach in, in, in Gaza is if you use the time efficiently in the West Bank to demonstrate that diplomacy gives real dividends. If we're just like kind of putting our feet up on our chairs, doing nothing, then Hamas will, you know, will say, this is what, you know, the non-Hamas people have delivered. I mean, so I, I personally think, you know, we could be fatalistic and saying, well, you'll see Hamas will come out of the woodwork. But I don't see the Israeli army or the Shin that melting away so fast. Um, and that has partly helped the, 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 the Fatah people uh, get their 17 point lead in, in the West Bank, that they are demonstrating success. Fayyad does present 7% growth of the IMF at the time of a global recession. So I'm not saying that it's a, a slam dunk at all, but I'm saying what are the alternatives to this? I, I haven't heard anything that would suggest to me that we could do a grand deal because I, I do fear the Lucy of the football. I just don't believe it'll work. Uh, I have no reason to believe to try and fail almost guarantees another intifada, I think. And we lost 4,000 people on both sides last time around. So I'd like to see America succeed, and uh, I'd like to see the parties uh, be able to tell the public that they have a big uh, you know, result. I think it is interesting that a guy like Mofaz, who, you know, who's a, you know, a Sephardic, uh, a former IDF chief of staff, thinks somehow it's, it's good politically to put forward a moderate peace plan. And uh, if someone would have said that to me about him 10 years ago, I would have believed it. So I think there are some wins in Israel also that believe, you know, we have to give this a chance. So long as you don't pull out the I what, what the Israeli public cares about is that the IDF doesn't get pulled out tomorrow. That, 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 that you don't have a Gaza 2 where Israel gets out and, and, and the rockets start falling. Then you'll have no support, zero, in Israel. Uh, that's why I think the IDF, you got to be very cautious. Uh, Mufaza was amazed this afternoon when we called for international peacekeepers. 
first time he's ever said that. But uh, yeah. Well, you didn't, you didn't, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Sorry. I, I really good. Good. See good. Um, can, can we look, or have you looked a little more closely at, from the Palestinian side, how they, I mean, people around Fayyad and some rump reforming itself of the Fatah, whatever happens with, with Abbas, in terms of that they get what they're required in right. going to their public right. about this partial, you know, land swap borders deal. I, I, I mean, the whole question is, how does this not look like um, Bantustans or Cantons again? Um, there are notions about real contiguous land. Now, Fayyad has an idea of building up governance institutions right. and having something real to do that within. Okay, but you're, leave, you're leaving aside for obvious reasons the whole notion of land or whatever kind of bridge with Gaza. That whole governance thing is pushed off to the side. Around Jerusalem with E1, with the contiguity, the contiguity of neighborhoods, that is you know, that's a bigger that's not even included. I know, I know it's not included. I'm not, I'm, I know it's not included. So if, if, if so, you made the formulation about, I, I understand what you're saying, this West Bank land swap border deal first, and the beginnings of a case of how I could see Netanyahu possibly moving in that direction. But on the Palestinian side, how, you know, I mean, the whole notion of what's happening in Jerusalem is going to cut off Jerusalem from the West Bank and cut the West Bank in two. So if you're giving them two halves with, you know. Oh, okay, let me, let me um, uh, I, I said about Jerusalem that you needed some red line understanding, some not expansion, because it won't be tenfold on the Palestinian side to say, I'm deferring Jerusalem, but while I defer, you build. So there has to be understandings on that, in my view, or it won't work. Is, no. is, it, it, would Gilo be one of the places? Yeah, I would. I, would. I, I was asked by the Jerusalem Post. Uh, exactly. I was, I, I was you born in the state. You know? You know? And, uh, you know, this is exactly a place to all fears. And um, so, in my view, you, 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 know, you need some red lines on that. I, I don't want to take on Jerusalem now with Jerry's point about, you know, kind of mobilization of religious forces. I just feel no one's prepared the public so, to. to to do that, that's a Lucy in the football for sure. Um, so I won't do that. On the issue, the reason why I didn't include um, uh, what do they call the Sunken Road or the Elevated Highway, however you want to call it, in the in the numbers was actually more for the from the Palestinian side. I felt because Israel does not see that area as sovereign, and I felt if you don't see the area as sovereign, it's unfair to count that in the council. But Israel has said, yeah. that some of the Israeli plans have said, right. we'll, we'll give you some kind right. of bridge, and that'll count for 2% or 3%. Or we're counted as a half. Okay, but the point is, that'll but count I, the part we give but you. I didn't, but I but didn't, you're not. Okay. I didn't put that in, I didn't think it was fair to the Palestinian side, because I felt, you know, if you can tell it's sovereign soil, then count it. If it's not going to be sovereign soil, that it's better to do it as an offset against airspace issues in the West Bank. That's one of those creative contiguity for both people. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Well, you have to have a something road. You have to have ways, of, you know, beyond Hamas, the people, that, you know, do it. I just thought it's not fair if I was a Palestinian to count that. But not that it should exist. I would have it, but just one count it on their, on their, on their point. Some of us have been very smart and have already taken some food. <laughs> Uh, since we're a small group, I want to suggest that we get some refreshment. We come back and continue. Also, books are set for sale with uh, Mr. Fulton, and you get them signed. I want to get mine signed. Uh, but why don't we take a five-minute break, get some food, and come back. Tell me, what about Baguti? <laughs> How? I don't know. I, I think it'll be released at some point, but I don't see it happening tomorrow. And I'm part of it is because Abbas isn't pushing for it. Maybe for obvious personal reasons. Would he be part of the Shalu trade? I don't know. I, 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 I have to really be disputing, but the first thing is the first Thank you. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's interesting. That's not the whole thing was, uh, yeah. was, uh, it was preceded by the litigation in the high court in London, uh -huh. where the, the British courts compelled the British government to discourse the documentation. Uh -huh. Well, see, yeah. yeah. Well, we, you know, we had a very From Vancouver to yeah. Seattle, <laughs> and and then he was here, and they couldn't say he was here illegally. Really? Well, we still had to solve it because they weren't going to renew his visa. They were going to wait for his visa to, to end, but we sort of we got we got managed to get that so, sorted out with Chertoff. Well. It was a horror show. The reason he really? the list. What is this, an Iranian well, guy? That there is an Iranian yeah. who is in military. Yeah, I have told this here. What? To Obama. He worked with me on a trip to Iran. Mm -hmm. And to come back, he had to go back and get his visa. Yeah, sure. um, he got it in Dubai. Mm -hmm. I stamped it. But then they sent him an email saying, you won't be let in. He's over, he got into Canada, for eight months he sat in Canada, his family was here. And finally we figured out this amazing fact that he was on the super secret list that was so secret it wasn't available. Now think of the meaning of that if it really was a, it really was a terrorist. Would Baguti be on the Shalit list? The trade for Shalit? Who is he? I mean, I don't see a possibility for it. I don't know. 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 I don't we have a book for you. A book? I wrote a book. Brian, you got book? My friend. I know. And I, 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 sir, I miss not being able to, I mean, I haven't tried it. I tried it for you a couple of times. And then I stopped and just, you know, I didn't want to put him on the spot. I don't know. That's a message that I'd really love to get you guys to talk with him. It's, um, I, you know, none of this is not anybody's fault. Oh, you're sick of Steve's most of the time. Yeah. 
the lunch together every couple of weeks. And, you know, and we were very, we were very close. And we were close when we were working together for 12 years, too. Hmm. But clearly, from what we learned, you know, that's true. Yes, you can. Oh, that's the problem. 
you know, you can, um, uh, some say, you know, this issue of the breakout is a question. And I, I don't know enough to know, because some people say their ability, the technology that enables them to break out is going to be there in such a way that the breakout could be weeks. weeks. Weeks, you know. So I don't know enough on this, but clearly the U.S. would like some sort of a grand bargain with Iran, where there'd be no, you know, the U.S. Yeah, but I, but I don't see it. It doesn't seem like that's well, the only way. Ironically, the election made it impossible. Well, you know, but that's, but that's, this is the problem that I have with the discussion. I mean, the, the, it is. I mean, it's a question. I'm not talking about a grand bargain. I mean, yeah. if we go yeah. back to the suggestion that you made about laterals and. You know, right. you're, I grew up when Woody Hayes was the coach yeah. at Ohio State. Okay. You know, so you, you know, you do a few yards and a, a cloud of dust. You know, I mean, you you know I mean, right. so the... But if that cloud of dust is a mushroom cloud, it's the problem. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but in the... I, mean, I never want to hear that. I know. You know, but in Terrible. the... You know, but again, even that question, uh, you know, which is, which is implicitly from the Israeli perspective, is what is it that the Iranians are exactly afraid of? You know, and not a great Israel, really. You know, I mean, I think they're afraid of the Pakistanis, and I think they're afraid of the Saudis. And the, and of course, you know, they're looking, they're looking at us and saying, you know, the, you know, next door. You know, I mean, when, you know, objectively speaking, when you talk to them, they say, look, we've got the collapse of Pakistan on our eastern border. This is yeah. you know, one day. He said one day, and I actually somebody actually said this to me. One day, Jose Mubarak is going to wake up dead, and you're going to have a you're going to have an Islamic state on Israel's west and south. Not a chance. You know, then what? Yeah. You know, but I mean, this, this is all look. This is all their perspective. I'm not saying that it's right or wrong, but it seems to me that this is broader than. You know, what do you do to kind of settle things down? I mean, this is all everybody's afraid of everybody else, and and fear's a rational reason to do things. But you know, we are the big boys on the block. You know, and, and, and then what? I think on Egypt, I agree with Keith. The Maghreb the the is so strong. I, I you know, the that Pharaonic state is for four thousand years. I, mean, I think it's just have a different pharaoh. I, uh, I, I was in Egypt when Zidab was killed, and yeah. uh, there was no question yeah. that number two, well, at least he had a number two. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that the army comes out of the street, everybody's quiet, the next guy takes over, they have a referendum a few days later, it takes 99% of the vote, and you're done. Uh, and that's going to happen. And yeah. who's it, whoever, I mean, Omar Suleiman is a nine year general than Mubarak. I mean, it'll, it'll be a general, I guarantee you. But it will not be bloody or messy either. It, it'll, 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 be, it'll be quick. Yeah. It'll be uh, effective. And we won't be surprised like we were around. I, I can't imagine. Uh, uh, that's the last place I ever expect that to happen. I mean, Egypt is, is a, has the oldest tradition, maybe China, also, of, of, of strong sentiments. The Iranians are afraid of soft revolution. That's their biggest Which is obsessed with, and they're, second, and they're secondly afraid, uh, which is connected to the Soviet Revolution, of minority uh, and tribal and ethnic, um, you know, dissipation, Kurds, Azaris, etc. That's that's a long way down. But those are the two things that they fear. I don't think they fear these other countries. Saudis are not going to attack them. No, I mean, no. uh, they, they don't know how to use their own. No. Uh, Weapons. I mean, they, 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 let me you ask. Let me ask you, Mark, because I know you, you, you know, you follow this, and you might follow. Because I get all these Iranians who say that the supreme leader keeps talking about, you know, the soft revolution of, you know, Hollywood, and he said, you know, you have no chance with the supreme leader. He, he feels that America's influence is so pervasive culturally that it will, it will, it will, it will, it'll, it'll, it'll be so corrosive. You know, in, in Iran, that um, you know, he, he cannot allow that. What's going to happen when he's going to die, like Mubarak, pretty soon? It'd be very interesting if the Islamic Republic survives his death. Um, Who says that Mubarak will ever die? I don't know. He was terrific. He 
Well, she really does look terrific. Yeah. The lead, they are very, they are, they are, yeah. they are very afraid of Hollywoodization, yeah. of Western corruption. On the other hand, I have, it's already there. It's on the other hand, I have to put it this way, and you're going to laugh at this. You know, George Bush could have offered to pray with them. That would have that would have uh, affected them. You could send over uh, ministers. That will affect them. I mean, they also will. It's you know, they, they, they no, but they, yeah. the point is, they all they also see the U.S. as a religious country, they, as opposed to Europe, and we don't think any advantage of that. The largest, it must be the, the largest church-going population on Earth. Mm -hmm. African Americans. By the way, well, you're right. We are related to Americans. They love, by the way, they love African Americans because they see them all as third world. I mean, we sent Keith Ellison over. He can do more than anybody. And what I'm saying is, these are the the kind of things that we could work with them. Take it, you know, take advantage of their beliefs. It's interesting in terms of what's happened since June. Is that I think the system is, is basically paralyzed. They can't make a decision like was a first offer.